Good morning and welcome to Evidence-Based Practice. We are going to go through this uh, slideshow and hopefully that will help start to pull together some concepts for you. This is based on a class that I took for part of my doctoral studies at Duke University and Dr. Susan Silva's work. Oops. Okay, this course will focus on research designed to guide nursing practice and to improve the health and quality of the life of our clients. We all went into nursing to make a difference. We want to use the best evidence possible to make that difference. Resources are limited, time, energy, and money, and we cannot afford to waste them with interventions that are not effective. So that is the whole point of nursing research, is to find the best interventions, the best way of doing things to help guide and improve the health and quality of life for the people that we serve, whether that's uh, patients, families, or communities. Nurses now at all levels are encouraged to engage in evidence-based practice. You may not ever do original research, but you're certainly going to be utilizing someone else's original research to base your patient care decisions. Just a quick review. Some of you have had uh, an opportunity to read the book. Some of you may remember this from Role Transformation. But EBP is designed defined as the use of the best clinical evidence for making patient care decisions, applying the highest quality of knowledge in providing care to produce the greatest impact, not only on health status, but health care in general. The goal is to develop strong evidence base through more rigorous methods and multiple confirmatory strategies. And we're going to be talking about that, those concepts, all semester long. Selection of appropriate and strong research design is essential to the process. And confirmation of evidence is needed to ensure that research findings are robust. Now let's just go through what some of that means. If you have read a study where a particular intervention as effective and it's a single study you may take note of it but it won't be as strong a, a level of evidence is if multiple studies all say the same thing about a particular intervention that's what's called confirmation of evidence or confirmatory strategies when a study is replicated in a different setting, maybe with different clients, uh, different regions of the country, and they come up with similar results. Again, here we I talked a little bit about confirmation strategies, and that's uh, exactly what I was talking about in the prior slide, is replication of those findings. Very strong evidence comes from multi-site studies. This evidence did not just come from a single hospital in central Florida. It came from a hospital in Florida, and Texas, and New York, and Michigan, and California, and Hawaii. It is um, multi-site uh, evidence. And sampling methods that uh, yield samples that are representative and sufficient in size to adequately address the research question. In class, we talked about the mock example of finding the favorite ice cream flavor for Polk State College students. If I got a sample size of 10 or 20 students, that was not representative of the entire population of Polk State College students. It would not be sufficient in size to make inferences about the population. So we're going to be talking more about that as the um, semester goes on because the way you structure a research design and the sampling methods that are chose, chosen have great impact 
on the data that are produced. And again, uh, just a quick reminder, the word data is plural, so it will always be data are and not data is. It's very important with evidence-based practice to uh, understand the meaning of critical appraisal of the evidence. And part of that is learning about levels of evidence and how that's used in the process. We're going to be exploring how statistics and other methods can be used to appraise the evidence. And we're going to be applying that process in this uh, semester to uh, appraise a qualitative and quantitative study. So again, um, this is kind of the flow of the whole process. Sometimes you'll see PICO with a T, and sometimes without. That step is optional. But from your PICO question, your spirit of inquiry, I wonder if there's a better way to do this. Then you search the literature to see, gee, has someone already researched this? and then you critically appraise the evidence for its relevance. Critically appraising the ev evidence uh, involves assessing the strength as well as the quality and applicability to healthcare decision making. So you're, we're going to be looking at both internal and external validity and it might be useful if you get your book and uh, just reread um, those concepts. Um, what do we talk about when we mean quality of evidence? We're talking about the extent to which bias was minimized. That Now there is no such thing as a perfect study. There's always going to be some degree of error, but we want to minimize that error and minimize that bias by a good strong design and ensuring high degree of internal validity. So going back to our ice cream example, if I make um, a convenient sample of just the students in my class, if I'm conducting this research about ice cream flavors at Polk State College, and I just say, oh, well, I got a group of students here in my class, I'll just grab them and give them a survey. That's a really very biased um, sample. The, the samples in the nursing classes tend to be predominantly female and older. They're not typically the 18 to 21 year old crowd. And so they may have a very different um, opinion about favorite ice cream than the rest of the population. So that would be a very biased sample and we would be making decisions that were really not true um, about what the favorite ice cream was. Also, if I were to strong arm you by saying, well, my favorite ice cream is butter pecan, and, you know, I'm going to be posting your grades next week, but, hey, you can choose whatever ice cream flavor you want, and here's a survey. That's very much influencing the subjects to um, sway them one way or another. And maybe swaying is intentional or not intentional, but very much all those little things introduce bias in the sample and lower the degree of internal validity. So again, we're going to be talking about that more as the term goes on. Uh, when we talk about quantity of evidence, we talk about the extent of the magnitude of the effect. How effective was this intervention? Did it really just marginally reduce some, um, say uh, we're looking at wound care uh, interventions? Did it marginally reduce the time that a wound needed to heal? Or was this a dramatic difference in the number of days that it took this wound to heal with this particular product versus that particular product? Again, we talked about uh, numbers of studies. If one study states, hey, this is a really effective intervention, eh, we take, might take notice of it, but if 25 or 40 studies all say the same thing and the size of the studies were significant, there were 
more than 20 or 30 subjects in each study, then, you know, that's noteworthy. And again, that kind of leads to the consistency of evidence, the extent to which similar and different studies report similar findings. So is this uh, wound care intervention effective with different races and different disease processes and in different parts of the country? That type of thing. The strength of evidence is often referred as level of evidence, and this reflects a continuum of rigor. Maturity of research design and methods apply do vary, so therefore the strength of the evidence varies. Type of research design utilized affects the strength of the evidence. So we're going to be talking about all these concepts more as the term goes on. Ranking how well the evidence informs uh, interventions is noteworthy as well. The next slide, next couple of slides talks about hierarchy of evidence. The stronger the evidence, the greater the confidence you have as a clinician that the probability of applying this evidence will be effective. So let's talk about these levels of evidence from Pollock and Beck. This is from the ninth edition of this textbook entitled Nursing Research, Generating and Assessing Evidence for Nursing Practice. So let's start actually at the bottom of this uh, hierarchy of evidence for level seven, opinions of authorities and expert communities. Those are very valid uh, level of evidence, but someone's opinion uh, whether it be an authority or a committee, is not going to be as strong as the level above it. A single descriptive or qualitative study that describes uh, findings that support this, um, whatever you're, you're stating is effective. That is good, but it's not as good as if there were multiple descriptive or qualitative studies and someone did a systematic review of those studies and say, hey, you know, here are 20 or 30 descriptive studies based on this um, research question and they're all saying the same thing. That is noteworthy. That is good, but not as good as a single correlational or observation study where two interventions are actually looked at and l looked at their relationship or how they correlate with each other. Does this influence that? Does this have a relationship with that? Again, that is good, but not as good as a systematic review of correlational and observational studies. Level two is a single randomized controlled trial, that's what RCT stands for, or a single randomized, non-randomized controlled trial. That's where an actual intervention is uh, introduced. And again, the highest level of evidence, I've put that in red, is a systematic review of um, randomized or non-randomized clinical trials. Here you can see kind of a, a hierarchy of that. There's going to be a lot more uh, level of evidence in the bottom tier, uh, expert opinions and expert opinions of committees and authorities because the top level, level one, systematic review of research um, based on clinical trials are rarer. Research is expensive, time consuming, and involves a lot of expertise uh, in terms of research methodology and uh, uh, statistical analysis. So it's not going to be as common. So that's why you see the pyramid where the bottom bases are larger, more common than the top bases. This relates to your discussion board posts on week two. These are the type of uh, research um, designs that you might see in the literature. 
One is interventional research that is focused on a treatment, a therapy, or an intervention effect. The second type is diagnosis, developing an instrument that measures, screens, or diagnoses patients or looks at clinical outcomes. And prognosis is another finding or research design where it's looked at outcome of disease problems or the probability that an outcome will occur. So let's just look at maybe uh, smoking and lung cancer with these different types of um, research designs. If we were looking at intervention, we might want to see if maybe a particular treatment is effective in um, stage 4 lung cancer uh, controlling symptoms. We might want to look at disease prevention and look at um, it, is this particular kind of advertisement for um, you know the general public effective in um, reducing the new number of uh, lung cancer cases due to smoking. We might want to look at that. Diagnosis and treatment or assessment, we might want to look at a more effective ways to uh, screen or diagnose uh, patients with early lung cancer. Uh, prognosis, we might want to look at the probability of an outcome based on a particular treatment. For instance, if treatment A or treatment B are compared, uh, what is the outcome uh, longitudinally? Are one group of patients more likely to survive longer and healthier than another group of patients? So you can take the same research question and look at it in different ways. Again, uh, continuing these focuses of um, research designs, we might want to look at harm, identification and prevention of harm effects or exposures. We might want to look at etiology or causation, looking at the determination of factors that affect or cause illness. And these all have been what I've discussed to date or been more quantitative studies. We're looking at how many or how much. But meaning and process really gets into more the qualitative kind of research design, looking at the nature or the quality of something. So we're looking at examining what illness and health represents to clients and patients, maybe looking at the lived meaning of that, looking at identification of perceived barriers that clients face, whether in um, diagnosis or treatment, or um, how caregivers um, cope with um, transition through a healthcare crisis. So these are really more focused on qualitative um, approaches. The techniques used to structure a study and gather information are very relevant to the research question. You are not going to use qualitative measures to conduct a quantitative uh, research design. So again, it's very important to uh, distinguish between these two alternative paradigms. One is not better than the other, they're just very different. It's like saying which is better, vanilla or chocolate. You know, you really can't compare the two because in my opinion they're both fantastic, but one's just very different than the other. Um, a paradigm or approach taken has strong implications for what kind of research methods you will choose. When we talk about evidence-based practice, I want you to think um, of three components kind of upholding that concept. Um, knowledge and research, clinical expertise, and client values and preferences. Now very often the last column is ignored or minimized, and I'm going to use an example that's all very common to most of us. 
um, I would say probably all of us, is the whole uh, concept of the Jehovah's Witness and the no blood products. Now we all know from our knowledge and research that blood products uh, administration can be effective with certain clinical conditions. We know from our clinical expertise and judgment for that to be f true. But if we offer a evidence-based um, intervention that is not acceptable to the client's values or preferences, then that's not really going to meet our goal of improving uh, health care and the uh, life and health of our clients that we care for. So it's very important that that column is included when we look at the evidence and uh, look for an intervention that uh, we want to um, utilize for the health and welfare of our clients. So that is the end of this uh, presentation. I hope that uh, you dive into your readings and uh, I look forward to seeing what you uh, learn on the discussion board.